Maurice Nichol often refers to the system of the fourth way as Christian esotericism. But what does he mean by esotericism? In this video, we will look closely at one of the most well-known forms of esoteric knowledge, Gnosis. But before we start, consider subscribing to our channel so you will never miss any of our videos that otherwise stand the risk of getting esoteric or hidden from your view and will dramatically impact your level of Gnosis. But seriously, what is Gnosis, and how does Gnosis relate to esotericism and the system of the fourth way? Even though the term esotericism is hardly transparent, as it can denote many meanings, it is mainly associated with qualifications like inner or secret knowledge. Gnosis is a form of esotericism, and although esotericism cannot be reduced to one single set of principles, it can be considered the third current of thought in Western culture, as opposed to Christian religion and Greek rationality. Much of the esoteric texts are rooted in Hermetism and the writings of Hermes Trismegistus, of whom his exact time of existence and role in esotericism are still being debated. Gnosticism is a strand of esotericism that believes in inner enlightenment by the encountering with your true self. Gnostics see a concordance between the inner and outer worlds as alluded by the well-known expression, as below so above. One of the most fundamental unifying aspects of Gnosticism, however, is the thought that salvation is only possible through Gnosis, and in contrast with Christian dogma, cannot be earned solely by good deeds and living an ascetic life. For a better understanding of the origin and place of Gnostic traditions in the West, we need to start by taking a closer look at the rise of Christian religion. The success of the spread of Christian faith wasn't obvious from the outset. From the Common Era, many strands of religions and life philosophies had their share of influence on their followers, much depending on their specific geographic orientation. But Christianity spread across much of Europe and the Roman Empire in the 2nd and 3rd centuries as it became increasingly organized into a disciplined and established church. During this period, Ample attempts were made to come to some synthesis between Christian religion and Greek philosophy, as the Church wanted eagerly to underpin Christian dogmas with philosophical rational arguments, and in doing so, made philosophy the handmaid of religion. But different Christian theologians' attitudes to philosophy varied. Some early Christian writers, such as Justin Martyr, a convert to the new religion from Platonism, used texts from Plato's dialogues for Christian purposes, claiming that the Hebrew Bible had influenced Plato. But others, such as the prolific early Christian African author Tertullian, claimed that Athens and Jerusalem, as in Greek rationality and Christian faith, had nothing in common. Tertullian therefore, condemned all attempts to synthesize Stoic or Platonic philosophical principles with Christian doctrine. In the second century, Orthodox Christian theologians were less engaged with battling pagan philosophies than debating with denominations within the Christian Church itself. Many had devised bulky mixtures of Platonic cosmology with Jewish prophecy and clunky constructs of Christian theology with Oriental mysteries. It was obvious that a synthesis between the two main Western traditions of thought would not result in an easy marriage. This is where the relevance of esotericism comes into the picture. Although many religious traditions already spoke of hidden meaning in their mysteries, it still was commonplace to adhere belief to such mysteries, just on the basis of the authority of the Church. But whereas both Jesus and Paul had preached a message available to the poor and unlearned, scholarly rabbis and erudite philosophers claimed to possess special mysterious knowledge or gnosis. The 16th-century Swiss philosopher slash shoemaker, Paracelus, even claimed to have found rational philosophical explanations for Christian mysteries such as the resurrection of Christ and the threefold oneness of God. Paracelus' arguments made rational understanding of these mysteries available for the common man, making the scholarly rabbis of the Church obsolete. So mainstream Christian writers started to denounce Gnosticism as heresy and look for philosophers totally outside the Church. They looked, for example, at members of the Stoic school, which had regained popularity under Roman rule. However, even the adherents of such classical philosophical traditions were not always clearly distinguished by Christian theologians from Gnostic heresy. 
members of a group known collectively as Gnostics, supposedly had access to these ancient secret teachings that the first apostles had handed down. The Gnostics believed that salvation was not a product of living an ascetic life based on Christian values, but of being in possession of special knowledge, Gnosis. They thought they were in a privileged position, apart from the simple faithful, who were not endowed with the rational capacity to understand Gnosis and, therefore, could only rely on salvation by the grace of God. In contrast with Christian doctrine, Gnostics did not believe that God created the material world. God was only the creator of the divine heavenly spheres that superseded the visible world. The creation of the earth was either the work of the devil or a jealous platonic demiurge, as it was the work of lesser and malevolent powers. Therefore the creation of the material world was an utter disaster. Because the material world was evil, it followed that it was sinful to marry and beget children. Some Gnostics practiced an ascetic discipline, others were riotously promiscuous, in both cases, the basic premise was that sex was contemptible. The cosmos was governed by evil powers, living in the planetary spheres, and during life, a good Gnostic should shun any involvement with the material world. Gnosis armed the Gnostic with incantations that would open the barriers, placed on its way back to heaven, by the evil powers. At death, the soul, if purified adequately by Gnostic ritual, would return to the divine spheres to be reunited with God. But in what way is the system of the fourth way, esoteric or Gnostic? One striking similarity can be found in the Gnostic concept of a dualistic cosmology. The fourth way in that respect speaks about a ray of creation and the law of seven related to the seven planets and the way humanity can elevate itself. The earth is considered to be only second to the worst place in the ray of creation whereas the amount of laws increases with every step further down from the sun, the beginning of the ray of creation. So the material world is a bad place, like in most esoteric teachings, and one needs to rise above the material world through self-knowledge. Another striking similarity with Gnosis is the hidden quality of the thoughts and principles of the fourth way, only accessible to the one possessing a magnetic center. There is no talk of salvation in the fourth way, but a parallel can be seen in the encountering of your true self as in the act of self-remembering, and salvation as an expansion of consciousness by activating higher parts of emotional and intellectual center, so one can be susceptible to higher influences. We hope to have inspired you to start seeing the resemblances and differences for yourself when verifying the thoughts and principles of the system of the fourth way. If you want to explore more on this topic, please click the suggested video on the screen now. If you have found any valuable Gnosis in this video, please reward our production team with your like, that will be much appreciated. Thanks for watching.